Houston's original neighborhood downtown is for everyone. And right now is the perfect time to check out their Market Square Park Farmer's Market. Every Saturday until November 16th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the Farmer's Market is putting a spotlight on local growers and makers who are providing access to seasonally fresh and affordable fruits and vegetables, plus meat proteins and prepared foods, as well as other household goods. There's also live music from local artists and other entertainment, and it's free. You can learn more at downtownhouston.org. Downtown Houston, get energized and revived. Today on CityCast Houston. In 1979, Houston was considered the murder capital of the country and relations between the Hispanic community and Houston police had hit an all-time low. So the HPD tried something radical. An all-Latino task force called the Chicano Squad, who was charged with solving some of the city's most violent crimes. For executive producer Sergio Salvera, the story is personal because his dad was one of the original members of the squad. He joins me today to explain how the team changed community policing in Houston and the nation. It's Thursday, September 26th. I'm Raheel Ramzanali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Sergio, what's up, man? Welcome into CityCast Houston. I'm so excited to talk with you. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. So let me start with this. What was it like to have a dad who's a police officer? With my father as a police officer, you know, I, I just thought it was normal, right? Everybody said you, they know your dad. And I'm like, well, I guess everybody knows every police officer, you know, so cool. But I had no idea that my father was involved in this thing called the Chicano Squad. And I had no idea that it was so impactful. And I also didn't know that from the late 70s to the early 80s, they were on the news so much and in the newspaper. Like, I had no concept of that. I, I, I just genuinely thought people knew my dad. Like, oh, I know your dad. Like, I know the guy at the grocery store or the guy at the you know, hardware store, whatever, had no concept of it. Wow. You know, and I have to admit, okay, I didn't know about the Chicano Squad until I watched the documentary, which I absolutely love. By the way, we're going to talk about it throughout this episode. But can you tell the listeners who exactly was the Chicano Squad and what did they do? So the Chicano Squad was the first all Latino homicide unit in the country in Houston, Texas in 1979. Houston was the murder capital of the country at the time. So you had that as a backdrop. And also you had all of these Latino families in Houston grieving, mourning, and their loved ones are literally just being stacked on a desk somewhere, just piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up. And there's no dignity in that. There's no closure in that. How can you move on as a family when, if you're calling the police department, number one, maybe they have someone that can speak to you in Spanish, maybe not, but also like they really have no answers to you. And so I go over to translate and I wound up doing the whole thing because all of them were speaking Spanish. The victims were Hispanic, the witness were Hispanic, and the suspect was Hispanic. And I was working nights because I was the only one that could speak Spanish. These men, number one, the idea to be promoted from officers straight into homicide, like that wasn't heard of. Um, seeing Latino police officers now wearing suits and ties to work in a homicide with the other detectives was unheard of. And then because it was so new and such a radical idea at the time, I mean, it was kind of one of the origin stories of, of uh, community policing in Texas. So this was just like a real new idea that kind of just hit on the scene back in the late 70s, early 80s here in Houston. You know, it was very revolutionary, right, for all the reasons that you just mentioned. But it was born out of necessity, as you talked about, like these homicides are just often forgotten. And to me, like watching that documentary, it wasn't this like aha moment. It was just a, hey, we need help with this. Can we figure this out? And it turned into a revolutionary thing. And you know, I've had a chance to kind of think about it, but I think it's just like with any organization, whether it's law enforcement, you know, a regular business, whatever, it, it's you have to be intentional about things, right? So I think it's safe to say that at that time, the police department wasn't being intentional about serving a certain sector of this community. And at, within this story, the Latino population in Houston, Texas in 79. You know, with the Chicano Squad, as I was watching the documentary, I started getting a lot of anxiety, okay? And I'll explain why. Because this group is put together and they are now charged with solving homicides being 
basically a liaison for HPD and the Latino community. And then they're also facing a lot of challenges internally. Like as I'm watching, I'm going, okay, you've got Latino men who are in a very white department and they're being judged all the time. What is going to happen here? What challenges did they go through for listeners who don't know? Okay, number one, just being a police officer in general in the murder capital of the country is just, that alone is a very challenging job. And that's regardless if you're in homicide or any of the other divisions. Like that, number one, is tough, right? Number two, they were in a kind of environment where police relations within the Latino community were were probably at their all-time lowest. You had the Joe Campos Torres uh, tragedy. You had the Moody Park riots. And then a year later, this is when the Chicano squad was formed. So over this three-year period is probably when community relations are at pretty much the bottom. Like I don't know how they can get any lower than that. And that's the space in which these men enter into like, hey, all right, great. You got a shot. Go do your job. And you have 90 days to do it. But that was the backdrop to it. Sergio, you brought up the Moody Park riot. And that's another big event that people often forget about and how it's impacted our city. Like researching for the documentary, producing the documentary, what did you learn about that? And how did that impact the formation of the Chicano squad? So the Moody Park riot was like May 1978. And, you know, it was as a result of just, as we said, the police relationships all time low with the community. And it was right after the verdict of the Campos Torres case where, you know, one dollar, one dollar for a life. You know, regardless of what happened there, like nobody's life is worth a dollar. It doesn't matter who you are. And I was born in 83. It was they were talking 78. So this is like five years before I was born. But through the research, you kind of discover that every community gets to a point where like enough's enough. Right. And I think what you saw happen there was just a community that was hurting. And there was a lot of rage building up because of how they were treated and the injustice. And it kind of, you know, hit that boiling over point. And I think that's what you see in the Moody Park riot. And then also like the sad part about the Moody Park riot, it, it, it was also like a Latino neighborhood. So a lot of like business owners and, and homeowners, you know, they lost a lot of things during this moment of rage that happened there. And again, this was about a year before they formed the Chicano squad. And, and that kind of sets the table for what these men were about to endure through this first 90 days. How receptive were other officers of the Chicano squad? Uh, I don't want to speak for the men, but I also know based on the research in the doc, I, I, I think it was twofold. So number one, you know, there is a very strict protocol on how to promote within the department. You know, if you want to go from officer to detective, you have to take exams and there's things that you need to do. And, you know, we want to respect that. However, the people that were taking these exams and promoting to detective weren't able to serve this large population of the city of Houston. So it's kind of like we have to come do your job for you because you're not doing it. And I don't think anybody wants to hear that. I mean, would you want to hear hey, this podcast is uh, great, but you're not doing a great job. So we're going to bring someone else in that can do it better than you. And nobody wants to hear that. Like, I understand that. So like, that's like the nice way of putting it. And plus like 1979 Houston, I mean, socially, politically, racially, a very different place than it is now. And I love Houston and I know you do too. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm not trying to bash Houston, but it's just, you know, Houston was probably not the most progressive city in the country. But it was cool to see that some of these officers were like, yeah, it's fine. Come shadow me. Let me teach you yeah. on the fly, pretty much. So there is that beautiful side of Houston as well in that time frame. Yeah, and, and I, I think you hit it right there. And I think anybody who's lived through like any of our um, weather emergencies or hurricanes, we know that like at the root of Houston, we genuinely try to help each other. I think with these men, were there people in the department that didn't want to see them there? Absolutely. Did they not like that? They represented progress was in the department. Absolutely. However, were there other detectives in there? They were like, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, we have a job to do and these men are here to help us and we're going to help them succeed. There were those people too. The first 90 days of the Chicano squad, Sergio, was a show me, prove it, and we'll keep this unit together. How hard was it for the Chicano squad? I mean, this is, hey, you're going from patrolling to solving murders. How prepared were they? You're a sports guy, right? You got preseason. Yeah. Their preseason was about three days. Wow. Yeah. So that was uh, it's kind of the environment. If you watch the doc, you'll hear my father say, 
as it was happening, he thought it was just a PR stunt. And he thought that the community probably thought it was a PR stunt. They're like, you know, community relations are so bad. Let's form this thing where we have the Latino officers and we'll just kind of put it up there like, oh, here's your new task force. We're going to solve the problems. And then it was one of those situations where if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, well, we told you so. And with a PR stunt, you would think the community would embrace it, right? Like, oh, look, there is a squad of Latino officers who are here helping us. How did the community embrace the Chicano squad? Because as you mentioned, tensions were high between HPD and the Latino community going into the Chicano squad. People actually thought that they were there to kind of spy on the community. They didn't know that they were there to help. And, you know, to be fair, a lot of these men, and they even say it themselves in the doc, like, they understood that these neighborhoods didn't have the best relations with the police. Like, they just didn't. Like, it, it wasn't a situation where, like, yeah, I'm happy to see that blue car come down the street. Well, this is back when they were blue. That blue and white come down the street. You didn't, you didn't want to see it because it was not going to treat you fairly in their opinion. Now, once they learned that they could trust these men, then it became like, wow, we have someone for us. Like, let's cheer for them. We want them to kind of go as far as we can. And, and they actually had like their own kind of like a bat line, like the bat phone. Remember like the old Batman? They had, they had their own phone number that they eventually got later. And the community trusted them so much, they would call them for like things that weren't crime related. Like you had like little old ladies calling them, asking them to help them with their water bill and stuff like that. Oh, that is so sweet. They almost became like superheroes for the community, right? But they had to work crazy hours. They worked really hard to prove themselves. What toll did that take on the families of the officers? And what do you remember in terms of your dad being around and how hard he was working? You know, one of my memories of my father, and this is like going back to like the 80s, when pagers came out, there wasn't a weekend or time I was with my dad, that thing didn't go off. And it's a very distinct sound. It was like, it, it started vibrating or you hear that beep, 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 beep. And again, like, I don't know how old your listeners are, but pagers was a thing. And I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, that thing goes off so much. And again, this was before cell phones. So like, you're like, well, why didn't you just have a cell phone? That's why. Because it was, we're talking about the eighties. But I, I remember that. And I also remember that a lot of the men, and this isn't in the doc, but they had another job, right? So you have your police job as a homicide investigator, but you also have sometimes what I guess is referred to as extra job. You might work security like at a law office or at the Astrodome or wherever. Like you have another job that you work in your actual uniform to go and obviously make more money, help provide for your family. So when we're talking about the workload, I mean, a lot of these men worked the crazy kind of 80 hour weeks plus the extra job on top plus the pager going off all the time. Did it tear apart their families? I would say so. You can see in the doc, um, some of the men get pretty emotional about it because, you know, they're out there saving and protecting other people's families, sometimes at the detriment of their families and their home life. One of my favorite moments in that first episode was seeing the surviving members meeting up for that routine breakfast and just reminiscing and having fun with each other. Just that that brotherhood was so cool to see. What are the members up to these days now? You know, most of them are retired from law enforcement now. They stay involved with their community, kind of do the speaking things, make the rounds with like the retired officer um, organizations and whatnot. My father's still in law enforcement. He is at the Harris County District Attorney's Office, still investigating. You know, he's law enforcement now 50 years. Wow. So most of them are retired, enjoying being grandfathers, which they, sh they should. I mean, they had really, really incredible careers and a really difficult job. And I, and I hope now they're starting to enjoy it and they realize what they did was significant. Because I can tell you over the five years that we really locked in on trying to bring this thing to life, like, up until this year, they I think they finally realized, like, wow, maybe we did something significant. Maybe this was important. And I just want to bring this up because I think the moment that that happened was during uh, the week of the premiere or the week before the premiere. We were at City Hall and they were doing like the 45th anniversary of, of the Chicano Squad. It was around August 20th around there. I, I don't remember the exact date that they did the reception. So it's a Tuesday. We're there. And if you've been to City Hall, there's a room called the Legacy Room. 
that they do like all the press conferences and you have like the art deco thing in the back and the mayor's usually there about the podium. So we were in that room before. So like all the families were gathering before and just kind of saying hellos and meeting up for the first time, excited about the show coming out. Well, as it happened, I remember that, you know, different police officers came by to say hello. Oh, I remember you. I remember this. But at, at a certain point when it's almost time to go into the main chamber for the proclamation. And I, John Whitmer, mayor of the city of Houston, hereby proclaim August 20th. 2024 is Houston Police Department Chicano Squad Day in the city of Houston. You know, the whole front row was filled and it was filled with Latino assistant chiefs and the new police chief, who is the first Mexican-American chief in HPD's history. That's going to work with our department. Collectively, we're going to have a safer city. So right. thank everyone for being here. And I remember my dad pulling me to the side and kind of looked at me and he just had this kind of like, smile on his face. I go, what's going on? He goes, I could never imagine this. And I thought he meant like the show, but what he meant was I have never seen this, these many gold badges with Latino names sitting in the front row in HPD. Like he was just like over the moon about it. And to know that he had a part in that kind of lineage and that history, it made him very proud. I know all the other men said the same thing. Yeah. And that's what I want to talk to you next about is the legacy, right? Because now you see HPD going out and supporting officers, attracting officers who speak other languages, you know, not just Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin Chinese, but in the 70s and 80s, this was very new. So to have these officers who were bilingual and culturally aware, do you think the Chicano squad changed policing, not only here in Houston, but across Texas and even the country? Absolutely. And and I know that through the research, we, we found that other cities, I think San Antonio, Austin, and they actually tried to form similar units with varying uh, levels of success. I think they definitely made their impact because, again, like aside from all of that, OK, great. You did it. It's great to be the first. Awesome. But this is one of the most highly decorated units in policing across the country, like not just HPD, like within just the five original men. You have officers of the year. You have all these awards of merit recognized by city, county, state, um, Congress. Like they're all highly decorated. So this one of the most highly decorated units in the history of law enforcement in this country. Number one. And also, I, I do want to say this: over the years, we, there was about seventy men that came through the Chicano Squad, seventy nine through the early two thousands, and they deserve the credit too because they're all part of this legacy. You know, to get back to your question of. of some people stayed longer. I know that my father, Jose Silvera, and, and Cecil Mosqueda stayed the whole time. But you had a lot of talented men and women that came through this squad over the years. And, and I hope they all get the praise right now. Because the whole purpose of this, when we started this, um, I remember I sat with the men and I told them what I wanted to do. And, and ultimately, it was like, look, number one, I make you guys proud because I think you deserve it. But number two, I want to make your families proud. You know, And that's a little selfish to me because I'm included in it. But this is something that I hope that they're Brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, cousins, grandchildren, great grandchildren can take with them. And I and I thought it was so amazing that we got to, to actually tell this story while they're alive. You get to hear it from the actual men themselves versus someone else telling them their story for them. Um, which you know, in all these kind of communities of color, I think that's what we have to be aiming for to tell our own stories. And this one here, we had a great opportunity. You know, thanks to A and E for getting behind this. But you had Latino talent in the men. Latino producers in myself and um, Nancy De Los Santos, who is one of the producers of Selena, that little small movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then our director and showrunner, Mario Diaz, also Latino, highly decorated Emmy Award winner, all the way down to, um, well, up to the executive at A&E, uh, Maite Cueva. So, like, the representation was there, and I think we left it all out on the screen for you guys to see, and hopefully you're proud of it, because that was the whole goal here. I was so proud of it watching it as a Houstonian. And it was so cool to see how they not only impacted our city, but as you mentioned, across the nation. So the goal was definitely accomplished with this documentary. And one last thing, I want to zoom out, okay? Because not just in policing, but in all areas of working with diverse communities, what lessons do you think we can learn and apply today from the Chicano Squad? I get asked this question and, I, and I've kind of refined my answer as, as as I've thought about it over the last month or so. Number one, it's an American story, right? So like, we got to say that from the top. Like, yes, it's a Latino story, but it's an American story, just like all those other communities you mentioned. Like, those are all American stories. So I think we need to start looking at 
at all these stories through the lens of like, this is American history, number one, right? Whether that's Asian community, Latino community, black community, Middle Eastern community, whatever. Those are American stories, number one. But number two, we got to keep fighting for these opportunities. And we have to really hold our elected officials, our government agencies, and our corporations accountable. Be like, hey, you need to give certain folks opportunities because that is the only way we're going to make an impact here. And again, this is a police story, so it's real easy to count murders and clearance rates and all of that. But you can apply that same kind of logic to a lot of different industries. You know, media, your industry. I know there's a lot of communities that are underrepresented all the time. And I think these same types of lessons learned from the Chicano Squad can be applied to all these industries. So I hope it's a story of opportunity and what can happen when you give certain individuals opportunity to make an impact, a significant impact. That's perfectly said, Sergio. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being so passionate about this project and getting it to the screen and putting it out there and educating Houstonians and everyone nationwide, globally about the Chicano Squad. I appreciate it as a viewer. It was awesome. And thank you so much for joining us. Can I say one more thing about it? Yeah. Because, and, I, and again, because we we're talking about opportunity and I want to make sure that I say this. So the Chicano Squad was the top rated show on A&E both nights. And on the second night, the audience actually grew. So there is an appetite for this type of content, not just Latino content, every group. So I just want to throw that out there that, hey, when you give the consumer the opportunity to see themselves, they show up for you. So I hope that that's another lesson that we take from this. Representation matters. I'm with you, Sergio. Awesome work. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Rahil. That was Sergio Salvera, executive producer of the Chicano Squad, which you can watch on A&E. And a huge shout out to our colleague, Eva Ruth Morovic. She's the executive producer for CityCast Austin and also produced a limited series podcast about the Chicano Squad in 2021. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to three friends who also love Houston history. And give us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter, Hey Houston, for more stories of our city's history. That will do it for today. I'm Rehal Ramzanli. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. You have a big sports like following too, right? I do. I used to work in sports radio. Okay, cool. Are you a sports fan? Oh yeah, huge. Like pretty much everything Houston fans. Like, I guess if I had to rank them, I'm going Astros, Texans, Rockets, and then Dynamo and whatever else is going on.